A vortex sounds like quite a cool thing, but it's really a pain when we're flying an aircraft, creating a lot of drag as we move through the air. How and why does it make this drag? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fifth class in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're going to be moving away from looking at the airflow in a 2D way and adding in that third dimension. By adding this third dimension, we change the picture, make things a bit more complex and mess everything up a bit. Up until now when looking at aerofoils and wings, we've been looking at them in two dimensions. Obviously this simplifies the picture quite somewhat. Now we're going to introduce the third dimension and talk about spanwise flow and vortices. If we look at a wing from the front, we have an area of low pressure air above the wing and an area of high pressure below the wing. They are separated until reaching the wing tip. At this point, the air tries to equalize the pressure differential. Pressure always flows from high to low as the low pressure air has the least resistance. So it does this in a circular motion like this. Because the object is and the aircraft are clearly moving, it's not just staying as a circle. It's going to end up with a helical pattern like this. The more the air equalizes, the lower the pressure differential. So the less energy the vortex will have. So as it slows, it loses this energy and it starts to spread out into larger and larger circles, creating the typical vortex shape. The size and strength of a wingtip vortex is dependent on the pressure differential caused by the wing, the speed it travels through the air, and also the cord length of the wing. So the more lift produced by a wing, the greater the pressure differential. This means that the more drastic an equalization process will occur. There's a much larger pressure difference, so to equalize it's going to take more energy, so the vortex will become stronger in this case. The speed that a wing travels through the air also has an impact on the strength of the vortexes. So a fast wing travels through the air in less time, so it has less time to act on the particles in the air and create that large pressure differential. So a fast moving wing will not create as drastic a pressure differential and therefore the vortex will be weaker. Conversely, a slow moving wing has lots of time to affect the particles and create this pressure differential. So there's gonna be a longer, larger area of molecules affected and the strength of the vortex will be high. A longer cord has the same sort of effect as speed. You basically end up with a larger area of particles that are affected, and that means the overall pressure differential is larger, and therefore the strength of the vortex is larger. So a longer cord means you have stronger vortexes, a slower speed, and a larger pressure differential. So that's what a vortex is and how they become stronger or weaker, but why is that important? The reason we care about vortexes is the energy used to rotate the airflow comes from the aircraft, which of course takes away from the energy of the aircraft, which is felt as an increase in drag. The secondary effect of a vortex is to cause a downward motion to the overall airflow behind the wing, known as downwash. So the vortex will start here, come over the wing, and start to impart this downward force onto the wing and deflect the airflow downwards. This downward motion of the wing at the wing tip and the viscosity of air means it also drags down the overall airflow over the whole length of the wing. The larger a vortex is, the more drag we have and also the more downwash we have. Spanwise flow at the wingtip is what cause those vortexes to form, but the spanwise flow is also happening at all points along the wing. As a wing travels through the air, there's a greater amount of lift produced inboard than outward. 
The reason why will be explained at the end of this class, but for now, just know that more lift is created inward than outward. This means the pressure differential at the wing root is greater than the pressure differential at the wing tip. This means that there is a pressure gradient both above and below the wing. As we just learned, air will try to equalize pressure differentials by flowing from high to low. So air on the top of the wing will flow inboard. This is very negative air. This is only somewhat negative air. And on the bottom of the wing, it will flow out towards the tip. Very positive pressure air, only slightly positive. The air also has a forward component as it travels over the wing. This leads to the airflow over the wing looking like this on the upper surface. So it's forward and in towards the wing. In towards the wing root. And under the wing, you get airflow that looks something like this. It's flowing forward, but also out towards the wing tip. At the trailing edge of the wing, these two flows will meet. And the difference in direction, as well as the difference in pressure, has the same effect as at the wing tips. And it causes trailing edge vortices to form. that are much lower effect than at the wing tip vortexes, but they still exist. These vortices will also add to that downwash effect behind the wing, but at a much lower level than at the wing tip. This causes the wing tip downwash to be much larger than the wing root. So we've talked a lot about downwash because it is very important to deriving our reaction force. This is because the downwash, which is happening behind the wing, has an influence over the airflow before the wing, which seems counterintuitive, but stick with me. The downward component of that downwash airflow, when combined with our relative airflow, will produce a new effective airflow, the airflow that actually matters, which is gonna be a combination of the relative airflow and this downward component of the relative airflow. So our effective airflow is important because this is the airflow that determines our reaction forces. Before we said it was roughly 90 degrees to the cord line, which was, wasn't entirely true because it actually is 90 degrees to our effective airflow. This one with the two arrows here being our effective airflow. Because of this effective airflow, we have to define some new angles of attack. Before we defined angle of attack as this angle in here between our cord line and our relative airflow. With the introduction of the effective airflow, we can now also define two other angles of attack, the effective and the induced. The induced angle attack comes in here, alpha induced, and the alpha effective comes in here. Our induced angle attack is between the relative airflow and the e effective airflow because it is only there because we induce the downwash and create this angle difference between the two. And because we are now dealing with the effective airflow and the cord line, we have this angle of attack, which is the angle of attack effective. We assume that our reaction force acts at 90 degrees to this effective airflow. So our reaction force is going to come off close to 90 degrees here. So our reaction force which means that our lift force comes out vertically from that. And our angle in between here is actually the same as our induced angle here, due to some you know, geometry and Z angles, etc. What that means is that the more of an induced angle of attack we have, aka the steeper the effective airflow, the more that reaction force is gonna be angled back the way. And that means a greater component is drag and a lesser component is lift. As we change the amount of downwash, our effective airflow changes and that induced angle of attack changes with it. The larger the downwash, the larger that induced angle of attack. 
So if we think about the reaction forces coming off of these various air flows, as so, our induced angle attack, the one with the larger downwash in here, is going to be much larger and therefore the reaction force is going to be angled back more and a greater component of that force is now drag rather than lift. So if we have more downwash, we have more drag because an induced angle of attack is greater. So if we put that into practice along the length of a wing, as we stated before, the largest downwash occurs at the wing tip due to those strong wing tip vortexes. This in turn is the whole reason why we get more lift at the wing roots and span-wise flow across the whole length of the wing. So, as the vortexes are strongest at the tip, that means the downwash is greatest at the tip. The more downwash, the more the effective airflow is angled and the larger the induced angle of attack. So, if we get our reaction forces acting at 90 degrees to the effective airflow, it means that the reaction force coming off of the tip is going to be angled much further back than that of at the root because our induced angle of attack is much larger with more downwash at the tip. This means that a lesser component is lift at the tip and a larger component is lift at the root. And also drag is increased at the tip and drag is reduced at the root. So it's because of downwash itself that we have more lift at the wing root, which is why we have spanwise flow, which is why we have vortices, which is why we have downwash in the first place, which is why we have wingtip vortexes. It's all this cyclical linked in system, one bit feeding the other. To summarize, the pressure differential between the upper wing and the lower wing is corrected at the wing tips. Pressure flows from high to low, so it flows in this circular motion and it spins around itself as so. When it hits the air at the back of the wing, it imparts a downward force onto that and creates downwash. The strength of wingtip vortex is influenced by three things. First of all, the strength of that pressure differential. The stronger the pressure differential, the larger the vortex. Second thing is speed. The faster that we're traveling through, the less time we have to impart a pressure differential on those air molecules. So the faster you travel, the lower the vortex, or inversely, the slower you travel, the larger the vortex will be. The third thing influencing is the cord length. It's a similar sort of theory to the speed. The longer, the cord, the more air is affected, or the more time the air has to be affected by the pressure differential, and the stronger the wingtip vortex will become. Spanwise flow occurs on the top and bottom of the wing by the very fact that there is a higher pressure differential at the wing roots than there is at the wing tip. Over the top of the wing, it flows in towards the root and on the underside it flows out towards the tip. Where these meet, they form trailing edge vortexes which add to the effect of the downwash but in a much lesser proportion than that of the wing tip vortex, making the downwash pattern unequal across the length of the wing. The downwash creates a downward component to our relative airflow and when we combine our relative airflow with our downward component from the downwash, we come up with our effective airflow. The resultant aerodynamic force acts at 90 degrees to this effective airflow. So the more downwash we have, the further angled back our reaction force is, and the greater a component of that reaction force is drag rather than lift. More downwash is produced at the wing tips, which means that the induced angle attack is greater, which means that the lift produced is overall a bit smaller because it's a smaller proportion of that total reaction force. And at the wing root, we have less downwash, meaning that our induced angle attack is lower, 
So our reaction force is a lot more lift centered rather than drag centered. And that is the overall reason why we get more lift at the wing root than we do at the wing tip.